Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marina Korzenerik, and I would like to open a session on water justice, presenting a compilation of multiple studies that have focused on exploring differentiated needs and practices. I'm representing a project REACH that works primarily in eight places across Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Kenya that include both rural and urban places that have different water security issues around floods, water scarcity, and poor water quality. Outside the core program, we have also partnership grants, some of them working in the same locations and others covering other geographic places. Two following speakers will represent exactly this partnership grant. Water justice aligns with the political aim of reducing inequality. The question of water justice combines demands for more just socioeconomic distribution and for more or better cultural political recognition. Water justice and access implies both equality and equity, namely both the non-discriminatory equal rights, but also situated fairness, recognition of the specific needs and disadvantages of some social groups, prohibiting them from access to or benefit from the same opportunities compared to others. We can think about water justice at different scales in different people groups. For instance, Dr. Barbara van Koppen and Dr. Barbara Schreiner are speaking about legislative justice between large and small irrigators. I will continue, though, with a specific focus on gender, and Dr. Dalma Samir will continue on the same line. Development initiatives are seldom gender neutral, but are rather lacking specific attention to gender-based needs and concerns. That, in turn, may reinforce inequities and opportunities for water access and governance or social norms against women. While sex refers to biological differences, gender refers to social constructing differences between the sexes, norms, and cultural expectations on women, girls, men, boys, and how femininity and masculinity is defined. In REACH, we have 23 ongoing social studies related to different aspects of water justice. They present a mix of qualitative, quantitative, and mixed type of studies. They have been conducted at different scales, predominantly household community, but also at the national level. In the following slides, I'll present some of the insights from the studies. Given my limited time and the variety of the studies with their own specific context, I intend to open themes rather than define conclusions. The empirics of several of our studies pointed at the analytical dimension on negotiating water security. This is the topic that includes considerations of empowerment, agency, and process of negotiation. There have been certainly lots of research on them. Some of the major ones are listed below. Empowerment has been defined as a process of change rather than static or existing status. It implies choice, as Kabir would say, possibility of alternative choices. And Nussbaum would emphasize that choice can include preference for traditional life rather than following Western perceptions of how gender equality should look like. Choice is crucial to emphasize because there is a tendency to assume that more participation and influence over decision making is always good. However, there is a risk of neglecting the hardship of juggling many duties and responsabilization as a result. There is so, certainly an importance of agency that can imply multiple dimensions of capabilities or abilities to follow on goals and be realized in multiple ways including reproduction of certain practices when they are imbued with the meeting, reworking, and resilience. Structure or conditions or resources or opportunities, those are similar concepts from different authors, are of crucial importance as they emphasize what are the aspects that are aiding a process towards water justice and gender equality and which ones are hindering. Finally, water justice involves negotiations of power including power within individuals over their own decisions and choices, power within with collective actions, power of influential people over, over others. In the following slides, I do not aim to present all the possible aspects to this theme, but rather what came out from the existing studies. Most of our studies show that at least in 70%, but often up to 90% cases, the main water collector is the adult woman. However, when we move beyond that, what can we say about levels of negotiations that happen at different scales and spaces? 
There is a chain of different overlapping spaces where negotiations in different levels of influence happen. For instance, a study focusing on pastoralists in the northern Kenya reveals that women carry full responsibility for domestic water security and management, and they also exert significantly more control over water collected for household use than men. Women are able to deny their husband access to water they have collected because a man's access to water within the family home is by consent, not by right. Thus, at the household level, female responsibility for domestic water is a source of some power rather than a manifestation of a disempowerment. The other study from Ethiopia revealed that women's participation at management of different rural water sources differed depending on the type of the source and administrative level. The difference of women representation can vary from 3 to 40%. Social relations proved to be an important factor of consideration across many studies. Studies from Bangladesh, both in Dhaka and coastal area, pointed at multiple quarrels that occur among women due to the lack of entitlements of the specific water source that makes water collection uncomfortable or the stress due to waiting in the queue for water. The study from a rural, drought-prone and impoverished agropastoralist of wash basin in Ethiopia highlights, in turn, that those are particularly men who fear the risk of violent conflicts with neighbors over grazing land during the period of water scarcity. An exploration of governance institution in two counties in Kenya, Kitui and Lodwa, showed that at this level there are influential women stakeholders that are nevertheless lacking visibility and are usually left out from the networks of influence. When starting an initiative that which was launched is, by, is uh, creating a network of this woman. <clears throat> About the work, I will speak in the following slide. Within the theme of exploring the influence in water management and based on the Water Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, our partners have developed and tested an empowerment in water index in the rural Burkina Faso to measure agency, participation, and voice in the water sector. A set of fact indicators in the index can be compared over time and space for the purposes of diagnosing areas of improvement, evaluating the effectiveness of gender mainstreaming approaches, or in studying the relationship between empowerment and other outcomes. There have been some interesting and contested insights from studies that relate, relate to understanding water and work, particularly when women work in the factories or develop small-scale business especially outside the home environment. I want to highlight three locations done by different researchers of reach. Halosa, a new industrial park in Ethiopia with a high concentration of government factories. Those are predominantly young single women who have migrated from rural areas to work there. Periurban Dhaka, also garment industry factories, occupied also by rural women migrants. These women usually have families that have moved either with them or are staying in their home places. Vukro, a small town in Ethiopia, with a particular focus on women who are small-scale business owners. These are usually single, younger women, often single mothers, migrants from rural areas in search of economic independence. Households in all three places have tap water. However, they face other water-related problems. All studies of government workers reveal that despite infrastructural adequate provision of water and sanitation factories, access to them is a matter of individual negotiations, permission seeking, and the verbal abuse. Half of our respondents uh, in Hawass reported that. Access to toilets is restricted as it compromises needs of fulfillment of high production targets. Therefore, women prefer not to drink water and not to use toilets as per their needs. The second aspect of negotiation that has appeared across all three studies is water access at home influenced by weak power positionality of women. In the Wukra, water provision is extremely intermittent and is based on the geographical zones of the town. Most of the people are managing this difficulty. However, for migrant women, it is particularly hard because they do not have an established reciprocal network mechanism of mutual self-help. Moreover, since selling water is illegal, the 
They also face problems with buying water as they have not acquired trust. In peri-urban Dhaka, it is the landlords who control the timing of water supply, which can make it difficult for women working long hours to access water on their six working days in a week. Access to water by children is not always granted by landlords. Women have reduced opportunities to practice good hygiene due to the very limited time outside work, coupled with high rates of sharing of bathrooms and rented accommodation. This is particularly the case for women, as it is not culturally appropriate for them to undertake their ablutions in an open space. Let point to the final difficulty these work women are facing, namely necessity to balance their time poverty with ir irregular water provision. In case of Dhaka, it is the time when the landlord turns the water on that forces already exhausted women to wake up very early and to compromise on the hygiene, and if they're working overtime, then to miss water slot hour in the evening. In Wukro, it is the case of women working outside home, trying to guess the water provision and to rush home during the day, hoping that they reach the correct time slot. In many cases, this woman miss it all together, trying to negotiate water from other problematic water sources for up to a month. On my final note, as a trans transitional question before the next presentation, I would like to leave you with a question. Do we as researchers put enough of emphasis on subtle negotiations in different spheres? Please see references to all the studies that I have been talking about today and learn more about the individual cases.